Brother Bob's going to sing for us, and then uh, Brother Booth will come preach tonight. <coughs> Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way. And was wretched and vile as could be. But my Savior in love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reached down for me. When he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his son. When he reached down his hand for me, I was near to despair when he came to me there. And he showed me that I could be free. Then he lifted my feet. He gave me gladness complete when he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reached down for me, when he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his son when he reached down his hand for me. Now how my heart does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice. In the tempest to him I then flee, there to lean on his arm, safe, secure from all harm, since he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reached down for me, when he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his son when he reached down his hand for me. I was lost and undone without God or his son when he reached down his hand for me. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. So good to see you tonight. Wonderful crowd out for Monday night. I appreciate you being here. I encourage you last night. Uh, if you were here last night, and I told you, please, if you have to miss one night, don't miss tomorrow night. And uh, now I'm going to ask you tonight, please, if you've got to miss one night, choose to miss Thursday night. All right. <laughs> I hope that you'll be back tomorrow night, Wednesday night. These meetings happen so fast. And um, I sure want the Lord to, to use it, be a blessing, and speak to our hearts. And, and uh, I hope you're praying that way. I appreciate so much you coming out on Monday night. Most of the time, Tuesday night is a little bit of a, uh, a letdown in, uh, in most meetings. But let's not make it that way. Let's everybody be back. Invite somebody to come with you tomorrow night and one more night. And, uh, and it's done as far as this meeting's concerned. And we're sure praying that the Lord will use us at the prison and that, that they'll let Pastor and I both out. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and praying also to be a blessing Friday evening uh, 
to the Reformers Unanimous Meeting. And uh, boy, it's a great, great privilege to serve the Lord, isn't it? And what a joy to be in church. I don't get tired of it. I really don't. And you know, I grew up going to church and, and uh, hearing those good old songs. And man, I walk into church and hear those songs. And man, it's just like we're home. And uh, it's just good to be in church. I want you to open your Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to look at a very, very familiar passage. I hope we'll pull some truths out of it that will be a help to you tonight. Hebrews in chapter 12. Hebrews is a book that is written to believers. It's important you understand that or you can get mixed up in the book of Hebrews. And uh, it is written to believers and the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is encouraging those of us that are saved to go on to maturity. It's, it's trying to encourage us and show us how we can reach our full potential in our Christian life. And that ought to be a desire of every Christian, amen? When you get saved, there ought to be something burning in you that says, man, I just, I want to be what the Lord wants me to be. I want to be usable for the Lord. And the book of Hebrews teaches us about reaching our potential, going on to maturity. The last three chapters of this book really, really do that, uh, uh, teaches how, how to reach that maturity or that potential. And it's all by the means of faith. You know, it took faith for you to get saved. Nobody gets saved because they were good enough. Nobody gets saved because they did enough works or they turned a new leaf over in life. We're saved by faith. But once we're saved, it is the same thing that moves us on in our Christian life, step by step, day by day. It's the matter of faith. And so in the middle of this section, in these last three chapters, on, uh, on this matter of, of faith being the means for us to reach our potential, I want you to read with me now Rome, or Romans, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's ask the Lord to help us now. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, confess to you tonight, Father, that I'm not what anybody needs, and Lord, you know that within me dwelleth no good thing. But I'm so grateful, Lord, that you've been merciful and gracious and allowed me the privilege to preach, to serve you, to know you as my Savior. I come to you tonight, Lord, asking for help, asking that you'd please, Lord. Would you fill me tonight as I yield to thee? Would you endue me with your power? I ask of thee, Lord, that you would guide every part of the message, Lord. Help folks to have humble hearts that are ready not just to hear, but to do. Lord, these folks have come out on a Monday night. Would you please, Spirit of God, manifest yourself tonight. We know that you tell us in your word that you blow where you list it. We're asking thee inviting you tonight would you meet with us here would you make this a time that somebody will make maybe several somebody's will make decisions that make a difference in their christian life testimony for thee and usefulness for thee so bless we pray we'll thank you in jesus name amen so to run our race to our full potential, we're warned about two things here. We're to run this race looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. 
We sing that song, More About Jesus. And that's really what the whole Christian life is about, isn't it? It's keeping our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not our focus on our circumstances. Not our focus on people. Not our focus on ourselves. But our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And to reach our potential, it is essential that we keep that focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that the devil wants nothing more than to distract us from that focus. And so here we're warned, if we're to reach our potential as a Christian, be all that the Lord wants us to be, then there's two things that, that will be our biggest problem that the devil will use in distracting us from reaching that potential by keeping our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing he says is let us lay aside every weight. So there are weights. And it says, and then the sin which doth so easily beset us. Now that word beset means to trap. Uh, Webster defines it as to entangle or make escape difficult to impossible. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do. That's what he wants to do with your children. That's what he wants to do in your home. That's what he wants to do in your marriage. That's what he wants to do in the church. He wants us to get distracted from running the race, looking unto Jesus, by setting traps that are very hard to get out of once that he's got us entangled. And so he says, so the things we have to do is he said, you have to lay aside. And the first thing he says is wait. Lay aside the weights and, and the sin that so easily besets us. I remember preaching years ago, the first revival meeting I ever preached in my life, and it was in Southern California. And uh, I, I remember in that meeting, God really blessed. And man, we just had a great response. And, and in spite of my lack of experience and all of that, the Lord just, just chose to meet with us and Boy, that, that church just really, we had a bunch of folks get saved and folks were making decisions. And I remember in the middle of that revival meeting, a stocky, burly guy walked forward and, man, he's just sobbing. And he's at the altar and he was a member of the church. And afterwards, he asked the pastor, could I share a testimony? And he got up to share a testimony. He said, folks, you know I've been a member of the church for a good while. And he said, you know, I, I love the Lord, but he said, you also know I'm a very, very good softball player. And he said, every year when it comes time for softball, he said, I get recruited by three or four teams, and I'll choose to play on at least three in different, three different leagues. And uh, he said, during softball season, I miss Sunday uh, church a lot. I'll miss Wednesday night church. And he said, God broke my heart tonight, and I'm giving up softball. Now, folks, I like softball. <laughs> but softball can become a weight. And any sport can become a weight. You're looking at a guy that loves sports, but a sport can become a weight. Listen to me, today, the, we've gone nuts. I'm talking about independent Baptists. We think we've got to have our, our little girls in the cheerleading thing, and we've got to have them in the, this class, and the you know, boys have got to be playing this and that. Then. And I want to tell you something. When I was growing up, my daddy went to my little league coach from the, every time, every year I played and said, I just want you to know, he'll not miss Wednesday night church and he'll not miss any church on Sunday. So just understand that. And I remember many a game where I was playing in the game and my dad said, okay, it's time, we've got to go to church. But he taught me that nothing is to take the importance of being in church and serving the Lord. These things are not in and of themselves sinful but they can become a weight. And he said, so you ever hear people say, well, I don't see anything wrong with that in the Bible. It may not be spelled out in the Bible, but if it's hindering you from running the race, looking unto Jesus, and keeping the priority about Jesus, it becomes a weight. And there's a lot of things that are not sinful in and of themselves, but they're weights. And so he tells us, there's, there's two things we have to take care of here. We have to lay aside weights and the sin that besets so that we're not trapped, so we can fulfill our purpose, so that we can fulfill uh, our potential in the Christian life. So I want you to consider with me tonight the task, the truth, 
and the tragedy. You see, we all have a course assigned to us. Every one of us have a course to run. We have a sovereign God that has designed a course for us individually. Not everybody's called to be an evangelist, but everybody's called to be a full-time Christian and to fulfill the course that God has designed for them. Not everybody should get up and sing a special like Brother Bob can sing. I heard some of you singing, please don't sing a special. <laughs> but everybody has gifts and abilities that God has designed and designed a course for us to run. Remember the Apostle Paul when he was about to die in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy 4, 7, and Paul said, I have finished my course. What you designed for me to do here, Lord, I finished that. I completed that. So to finish that race effectively and successfully requires we've got to lay aside some weights. You can't run a race effectively carrying a bunch of weights. You can't run a race effectively dragging baggage with you. So there's weights that have to be laid aside. Our task, to lay aside weights. Secondly, to lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. Many, many times in my ministry, I have preached that that besetting sin is different for different people. Many times I've said, you know, maybe your besetting sin is alcohol, or maybe your besetting sin is drugs, or maybe your besetting sin is immorality, or we all have different areas. Now, we all do have different tendencies, but I think the scripture here is, is defining for us really what it's talking about. There is a sin that easily besets all of us. It's the sin. It doesn't say a sin. It says the sin. There's a sin for, that, that easily besets us. It's the same for all of us. We all struggle with it. It's all a, a, a challenge for us in this world. The sin which does so easily beset. We have to lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset. What is that sin that so easily besets us? Well, we have to always look in the Scripture at context. And I want you to go back with me in the book of Hebrews to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But you notice it says brethren. He's talking to brethren. Have an evil heart of unbelief. Notice what it says in verse 19 of that chapter. Talking about Israel, it says, So we see that they could not enter in, talk about the promised land, because of unbelief. Look what it says in chapter 4 and verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Look at verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Can you tell me what chapter 11 is? Before we, talk, before we looked at chapter 12 and verse 1, what's chapter 11 all about? It's about faith. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And then he says in verse 1 of chapter 12, wherefore? Otherwise, because all these examples I've just given to you, of those who walk by faith, those who live their lives by faith, those that ran their course by faith, he said, because of, wherefore? Because of that, you have got to watch out for that sin that so easily besets, and that sin is unbelief. You say, but you're talking to Christians here. We all are believers. No, there's a whole lot of Christians that don't practice living by faith. And you cannot run the race and reach your potential unless you run it looking unto Jesus. And to run it looking unto Jesus means you have to live by faith. Our great task in our assigned race is to trust 
the designer. Now stay with me. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 was my mother's favorite verses. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I remember when I was pastoring my very first church, my little girl was about three years old. And uh, we, we had a, a, a lady in our church whose husband was incarcerated. And she had a little girl about the same age as my little girl. And she had to go take care of some things, and we offered to babysit. My wife did, and so I'm home at lunchtime, and, and my wife's babysitting their little girl, and she's in the living room playing with my little girl. And they're playing like little girls do, and, and, and I, I'm overhearing their conversation. And uh, my little girl says to her, well, where's your daddy? She said, oh, my daddy's in, in jail. And my little girl said, why is he in jail? She said, he did something very bad. And my little girl said, my daddy never does anything bad. Now, thank God she thought that at three. Now she knows better. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. My heavenly father never does anything bad. And you can trust everything he tells you to do. And he, you can trust that it's always for your, your best uh, interest. He's always got your best interest at heart. It's always for all our welfare. I want to tell you tonight, dear friend, God in heaven that created this universe spoke the world into existence. He didn't make one mistake. He dropped 10,000 tears on Minnesota. He carved the Grand Canyon with his little finger. He set the sun in the sky and placed the planets in such a way that we're able to breathe air on this earth. And he did all of that without you and me. And didn't make one mistake. And he's not going to make a mistake with you now. So why do we have such a hard time trusting him with our life? We'll trust him with our eternity. But then when it comes to him directing us in each step of our life, well, I don't know. I, you know, I think maybe I could figure this out best. But I'm telling you, he's God when things are smooth and he's God when things aren't smooth. And he's God, he loves you as, as God when... When things are, are good and he loves you when things aren't so good. And he's good whether, whether you're on the mountaintop or whether you're in the valley. He's always good. And our task in this course that we are designed to run is to trust him. To trust him. And the truth of not trusting God or the sin of unbelief is a great offense to our God. And it's the downfall of every Christian that stumbles in the race. Every Christian. Let me give you a definition. What is faith? There's so much confusion about faith. Now, don't you think if you were the devil and you wanted to mess people up in their Christian life, you'd confuse them about faith? I mean, the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. So if you, if, if you were the devil, you don't want people to please God, wouldn't you confuse them about the matter of faith? And there's a great amount of confusion about what faith is. And I want to tell you what faith is. It makes, it's real simple because it's defined for us in the scripture. Look there at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's our Bible definition. What is faith? Well, the Bible tells us, number one, it's substance. Webster defines substance as something that exists by itself. Or that which really is. Something that exists. It's not some weird feeling. It's not a theory. It's a substance. Exists by itself. Or that which really is. And then he says it's an evidence. Well, we understand what an evidence is. You know, in court, they're supposed to not um, come to a verdict without the presentation of Evidence, right? So evidence is that which reveals truth and brings us to a conclusion or a conviction. If evidence is presented in court, then they're to respond to that evidence. It brings them to a conclusion or a conviction. So what is the substance that we see of that which we cannot see, but it's evidence 
there's evidence that God gave us. It's substance. What is that? That brings us to conviction or a conclusion. I'm telling you what it is. It's in your Bible. The Bible is that substance. You cannot have faith outside of the Word of God. Faith is not some weird feeling you conjure up. Faith is based on Scripture. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you can't have faith without the Word of God. Now the world's got this all messed up in people's minds. All the charismaniacs got it all people, you know, man, oh, I got this one. God told me. Well, show me in the Bible where he told you. Now God didn't tell you something that's not in the Bible. Faith has got to be based on the Scripture. That's why, folks, when you're out soul winning, you've got to use the Word of God. People can't exercise faith because you tell them something. They've got to exercise faith based on God's Word. It's all about His Word. So faith, is all, it always makes scriptural sense. It doesn't always make human sense. For somebody to tithe doesn't always make human sense, but it always makes scriptural sense. And we're to exercise faith based on the Word of God. We're to go to the Word of God to find out how to have the right kind of marriage. Not to the bookstore. We're to go to the Word of God to find out how to, have, how to rear our children. Not to the psychiatrist. It's, we're to live by faith. We're God's people. We're God's children. We run the race looking unto Jesus. The devil wants to get weights in our life to distract us from, from looking unto Jesus. And the sin of unbelief. Not trusting that God has our best interest at heart. My dear wife, we were visiting some relatives. And uh, older, older gentleman in our family. And, and he, he's you know, a little bit of a know-it-all type of person, you know, and, and he was saying he's, he's already close to 80 and, and uh, in, in, in good shape. And he said, well, he says, you know, I, I'm going to live to be 100, or I'm going to live to be 150, that's what he said. I'm going to live to be 150. And my wife says, why would you say that? Well, you know, as long as you believe, as long as you believe, that's, isn't that why? You just, as long as you believe, you'll, that's what will happen. She said, Claude, that's stupid. <laughs> and I want to tell you, it was stupid. The Lord, the Bible never ta- tells you that you're going to live to be 150 just as long as you believe that. See, you can believe something and convince yourself it's true up here. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. You've got to be based on the Word of God to have biblical faith. I've got a dear friend of mine, his wife walked out on him. He loves God, he pastored for many years. One of the finest Christians I know, he still wins souls. He has for three years left where he lived to live by her so that he could pay her bills, make sure she was okay, and hopefully win her back. I don't know many men that's ever done that. I mean, he changed his whole life to try to win her back. And you know what she tells him? Well, I mean, they go out to eat. They talk almost every day. And he said, well, Brother Boo, she keeps telling me that God hadn't told her yet to marry me, remarry me. Well, I want to tell you, he has told her. It's in the Word of God. But see, she's got this weird idea that she's waiting for some kind of feeling that she's supposed to do. Folks, it's not about feeling, it's about faith. And faith is based on the Word of God. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Unbelief. You see, King Saul had the blessings of God. Until you remember when Saul was waiting for the prophet to come and he wasn't there when Saul wanted him to get there? You ever have a problem with patience? I resemble that remark. And in Hebrews it says we've got to run this race with patience. This isn't a 100-yard dash. This is to run with patience. Shows how old I am, preacher, 100-yard dash. That's 100 meters now. We're running with patience. You know why? Because things aren't supposed to happen on our time schedule. They're supposed to happen on his time schedule. And Saul got impatient. And so he entered into the priestly office when he wasn't allowed to do that. 
and God took his kingdom from him. Uzziah was another king in the Old Testament, did the same thing, and God smote him with leprosy. Because they didn't trust God's timing would be right. Boy, I've got to take over and make it happen myself. You know how many families are in a mess because a wife won't listen to her husband? Uh oh, it got real quiet. Well, he might be wrong. I don't care if he's wrong or not. I'm telling you, the Bible said you're supposed to let him be the head of the house. That protects you. Well, I don't see how that will work. Now that's your problem, unbelief. You don't believe it because some preacher said he said, believe it because that's what the Bible says. We've got to get back to practicing Bible Christianity. We're hindered, not reaching our potential because we simply don't trust that what God said is what's best for us. Over and over in the book of Hebrews it said Israel did not enter in because of their unbelief. Can I tell you what messed up Moses? Sometimes people think, well, Moses didn't get to go into the promised land because Moses had a temper problem. I want to tell you, it wasn't his temper problem that was the problem. His temper was just an illustration of what the core problem was. And the Lord said to Moses, you're not going to enter in because of your unbelief. I told you not to, I told you to speak to the rock. You smote it. You didn't do what I told you to do. I want you to look at a powerful passage in Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 13. Here the prophet of God says, well, let's start with verse 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. I mean, this is serious stuff here. Prophet God says, hey, be astonished. All of heaven, listen to this. Be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. What's he going to say? For my people have committed two evils. Well, what, what is it? Must be they're running around on their wives. Must be that they're out getting drunk. What are these horrible evils? They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You know, he said, they've committed two great evils. All of heaven better pay attention to this. You've committed two great offenses against God. Oh, what is it? You've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. I have provided for you a path to walk, to have blessings, a refreshed life, the favor of God. I've laid it out for you. But you decided you'd dig out your own cisterns. So full of holes it can't even hold water. Drinking a bunch of muck and dirt when I've provided for you living waters. You know what grieves me all over this country today? I see those who used to grow up in an independent Baptist church that sat under Bible preaching, but they decided, hey, you know what? I'll figure this thing out better than that. I don't like all those rules. I don't like all that preaching. I don't like all that conviction. I'm going to do it my own way. And they dug out their own cisterns, and it's been a disaster. And it doesn't have to be that way. I was telling your preacher where I just came from, Mansfield, Ohio, I preached in that church when the pastor of that church was a teenager, him and his brother. I was only 10, but I'm just kidding. The pastor told me, he said, you remember a guy named, and he named this young man. I said, I sure do. I remember his mom and dad, faithful church members, loved the Lord. Paid that boy's way through the Christian school. Provided all he needed. He sat under Bible preaching all of his life. But he got on his own and said, you know, I don't need to be in church all the time like they say. I, I don't need these standards and all this stuff being pushed on me. You know, I, I don't need all that. I'll be all right. And he dug out his own cistern. One week ago, he called that pastor. 
knowing that he had a heart for people. And he said, Brother James, could you help me? I got nothing left. My family's gone. I don't have a car. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I have lied and stolen and used drugs until I am a waste. I saw him before I left town. He saw me and hugged me. I'm guessing him to be at maybe 40, 39, 40. And it honestly looks like he's at least 65. Bottom teeth gone. Skinny. Gray hair, gray beard. And I want to tell you something, it made me mad. Not mad at him, but mad that the old devil got his way. The old devil got him with that, that sin of unbelief instead of trusting what was being preached, instead of following what his mom and daddy taught him. He went his own way and it's been a disaster. Unbelief. You see, we think, you know, the horrible sins that offend God, you know, there are things like, you know, getting drunk and adultery. And, and God says it's unbelief. Because you see, most of those things come out of unbelief. I want to tell you something tonight. Control freaks never make good Christians. If you're one of those that has to control everything in life and you worry about, oh, I don't know what we can do, and what if the kids, if, if they're out there, and oh, I don't know, what, I mean, how are we going to pay the bills, and what, are we gonna, and what if we get a bad report from the doctor, and what? Can I tell you something? There's a God that loves you tonight. And that God that saved you has a course for you to run. And I want to tell you, if you just trust Him, you'll run that course with God's blessing regardless of what comes your way. You can trust Him with every bit of it. You don't have to walk around stressed out in life and frantic and depressed and worried and got to run to get this pill and get that pill just to make it. Unbelief. The sin which so easily entraps and captures us. We don't reach that potential God wants us to reach. We've got, you know, we have a football camp that we've been doing for 24 years. We beat young men for Jesus. Amen. And we've got, we've got mamas that, I just, I don't, what if he gets hurt? You know what I tell them? There's a real good chance he will. But you know what? You heal. You'll be okay. 24 years, we've never put anybody in the grave yet. We've tried, but not yet. No, seriously. Do you know what? If a kid breaks an arm, it'll heal. And you know, it's better to learn the character from the lesson than to never have an injury. And can I tell you what, Christian? If you're going to serve the Lord, you know what's going to happen? Hurts. People will hurt you. And you know, you can't love people that are filled with flaws without being hurt. But I want to tell you something. You can't minister to people without loving them. So you can build up the wall and I don't ever want to be hurt and nobody's going to hurt me anymore. And you've lost any opportunity to be used to God to minister to people. And you know what the bottom line is? God allows those hurts. He allows them for our good because he teaches us biblical character through those things. And he said, just trust me with all your heart. Don't try to figure out everything. Don't try to figure out why nothing, everything didn't turn out just the way you thought it ought to turn out. Just understand, you've got a sovereign Savior that has the course designed. Run looking unto Him. Faith. Control freaks don't make good Christians. The truth is, our unbelief is revealed by our reaction to trials. Our unbelief is revealed by our reaction to authority. Our unbelief is revealed by our reaction to correction. Our unbelief is revealed by our reaction to God's will for us. 
And you know, that's really what James wrote about. James wrote about that living faith. You know, the faith that's not dead. And in, in his book, he wrote the character of true faith is revealed by our reaction to trials, our reaction to temptations, our reaction to truth, our reaction to how we use our tongue. It's all about faith. You see, unbelief is at the core of anger. We're frustrated because we didn't get our way. We're frustrated because this happened to us. But God said he wouldn't let anything happen to us outside of his permission. Unbelief is revealed in bitterness, unforgiveness, frustrations, complaining, worry, panic, vengeance, unforgiveness. In essence, it's you believing that you know better for you than God knows for you. And that's a problem all of us battle with this old flesh. We battle with this old flesh. That's why you've got to stay in the Word of God. Because that's where our faith lies, in the Word of God. We've got to stay in the Word of God. It's hard to trust the promises if you don't know the promises. It's hard to follow the commands if you don't know the commands. You've got to lay aside weights and the sin. That sin of unbelief and not trusting the living God who loved you enough to give His Son for you. And maybe some of you here, you've drugged through your life an anger issue, a bitterness issue, because of the way you were treated by somebody, maybe a family member. Last week I preached in a church. One night at the end of the service, the preacher just said, anybody want to share a testimony? One of his faithful ladies in the church and her husband are faithful people. And she said, preacher, I just want to thank God tonight that he knew what I needed to hear. Because she said since I, and I'm guessing they were probably be about my age, 25, 26. I'm guessing they're around their 60s. She said, preacher, she said since I was a little girl from 3 years old to 13 years old, I was abused by a stepdaddy. She said, I have hated him all of my life. It affected the way I raised my children. It has affected my relationship with my husband. It has affected my service for the Lord in this church. And she said, tonight, God gave me victory. You know what all that comes back to? Trust in him. Really? Would God allow some? Yeah, God allows those hurts. Not because he wants us hurt. But I want you to understand, the, 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 in, you know, in 20 years of pastoring, the most effective Sunday school teacher for little girls that I ever had was a lady that went through the worst abuse I've ever heard in my life. But when she gave that to the Lord and said, God, use it for good. Lord, Lord, help me that I can forgive and that I, I can be able now to love some of these little girls that come in on the bus who only God knows what they're dealing with. She had more compassion for them. You know why? Because she accepted that what God allowed into her life, he wanted to use for his glory. Isn't that what Hosea did with his wife? It's trusting. It's, it's knowing that there's a God who we can trust. So let me show you the tragedy. Here's what happens so often. So often we see in our churches folks who went to independent Baptist churches X amount of years, and today they would not darken the door of an independent Baptist church. They use all kinds of reasons. Well, you know, a bunch of legalists out there, and I don't like all those rules and do's and don'ts. And Can I just throw out here and let you understand? Legalism is, is keeping a set of rules in order to get to heaven. You know, they say, well, we're under liberty now. Well, you know, when somebody is in prison and they've been given a pardon, they're liberated. They're free to go. But they're not free to go out and commit murder. They're free to go out and behave themselves. And when a Christian's saved, he's not liberated so he can just do whatever he wants to do. He's 
got the chains of the old nature broken so that he now can live the way the Lord wants him to live. They'll use all kinds of things. Well, I knew one time this guy, and he was supposed to be a good Christian, and I went to Christian school, and I was, was mistreated, and this wasn't handled right, and, and now, you know, every fundamentalist is wrong, and, you know, so I'm on all the blogs and making sure everybody knows about it. And I'll show you what has happened. Go with me over to the Hebrews chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Take heed, brethren. Here's the warning. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So here's what happens. When something happens that hurts us, we don't like, somebody disappoints us, somebody failed us, we either trust God that in his goodness he's got a purpose and we can trust him with it or we begin to depart in our faith at that moment. And when we begin to depart with anger, bitterness, chip on our shoulder, then look at the results. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So here's what happened. Well, yeah, you know, that I was in a youth activity, and that youth pastor, he, he got on me, and it wasn't my fault. You know, I'm, you know. And so you start carrying a chip on your shoulder. Person in church. Well, you know, I, I, was, I was working in this ministry, and pastor pulled me aside and said he didn't, he didn't want it run that way. And, you know, who's he think? He's not God, you know. And so here's what happens. Then they come to church, and suddenly there's something wrong with the song leader, something wrong with the choir, something wrong with the ushers. They get more and more critical. Their heart is becoming harder and harder. They never go to the altar anymore. And pretty soon they're out the door. They're going to go to another church. God's leading them to another church. Problem is, three years later, you find out they're not in church anywhere. They're sitting in a bar. They're, they're further down the road than anybody ever thought they could go because the deceitfulness of sin takes over. And it all begins with unbelief. Rather than trusting God, he had a purpose. He had a plan. We allow it to begin to infect us as if we could design the life better than God has designed for. I was sharing with pastor, there's a pastor that we know, he's a good man. His son went to Bible college, graduated from Bible college, came to work with him, worked with him for several years as an assistant pastor. And his dad was getting up in years and felt like it's time to turn the church over. He recommended his son to be the pastor, the people voted him down. They felt like he was kind of leaning a looser direction. They voted him down, he got angry. Bitter. He and his wife left. They moved to Arkansas. He began to pastor a church there in Arkansas. A evangelist friend of mine whose son was somewhat backslidden was a good friends with this pastor's son who moved to Arkansas. So he moved to Arkansas. Started going to his church for a while. He said every sermon was about how bad independent fundamental Baptists are. But he, he convinced everybody, you know, this thing about, you know, uh, not being able to drink alcohol, that's not in the Bible. That's what he told his people. He said, you, you can drink in moderation. So he took this evangelist friend of mine, his son with him. He's the pastor. He took him to the bar, and he's sitting at the bar to order and drinks with him. He's a pastor. Grew up in an independent Baptist home. That evangelist son finally left. He just didn't want to hear any more of that. But four days before Christmas this year, that pastor's son who was pastoring in Arkansas, his wife was on the couch. He said, honey, I'm going to go and take a shower. And he was in there about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. He came out of the shower, and his wife was laying on the couch dead. 
blue. They couldn't resuscitate her. You see, her choice of drink had become vodka. And she had been drinking vodka with taking some pills that she was taking to try to relax in her life. You know where all that started? Unbelief. Unbelief. Rather than trusting that God has his will and his purpose, got angry and bitter and mad at everybody. Unbelief. My youngest son got away from the Lord when he moved out of our house and made some choices that broke our heart. And he met a, a lady that he thought he was in love with, and she already had two children. She was divorced, and he met her and ended up marrying her. We didn't have any choice of the matter, so we loved her like our own daughter. She had a lot of problems. And they began to surface. And she would totally just lose her mind. She had stabbed Paul with scissors in the leg. She had just crazy stuff. She started seeing things and imagining things. And, and my son said, Dad, I don't know what to do. And i be honest, what do you tell him? She called the police four different times and said that my son was, was setting out chemicals to try to poison them, her and the kids. And the police had come out. They didn't, wouldn't find anything. And they finally said to my son, Paul, listen, I know you don't want to do this, but you need to have her committed to a mental institution. I hope you young people listen to this real well. Because I'm going to tell you, there's a forgiving, merciful God. But there's always consequences to your choices. And Paul got in his mind. He had some bitterness towards somebody that didn't handle something right. And Paul got in his mind that he could figure this out better on, on his own. He married out of the will of God, and we love her. But he calls me on the phone. Preachers see the picture of him. He's, he's a man. He's 6'2", benches about 435. And he called me on the phone and he's weeping like a little boy. He just said, Daddy, I'm watching him put the handcuffs on her right now. Taking her, taking her to the mental institution. Didn't have to be that way. Finally, he said, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to divorce her. So he filed for divorce in, Indi in Louisiana. It takes a year of separation before they'll grant a divorce. During that year, he paid all of her bills, made sure that she had money for food. And they were separated. He got custody of the kids because of her mental condition. She came up by where we lived. It's about four hours difference. And up where we lived, she went off her rocker again, and she got arrested by the police and fought them. And in Louisiana, it's the good old boys network. You mess with the police, they'll make sure that you pay for it. And so they put her in jail without bail for six months. She has nobody. Her mom and dad were killed when she was very young. She's from Malaysia. She has no family here. My wife and I'd go see her couple of times a week we love her but we notice something really strange here she is in that orange jumpsuit break your heart she was so thankful we'd come to see her but we noticed and we talk on the way home man she seemed almost happy she seemed at peace she's not blaming everybody she's not playing the victim and all of this that she's done all of her life And when she finally was released, she had nowhere to go. So we said, you come and live with us. We took her in. She's been with us over a year and a half without one incident. She reads her Bible every single morning. She has her faithful prayer time every morning. 
we talk all the time about spiritual things and things that, that she needs to learn from the scripture. But she told me when she got out, she said, Dad, I haven't missed one day in my Bible and prayer in the last about four, five and a half months that she'd been in jail. She said, I went to every chapel they had, and most of them were nutcases, but she, she had enough discernment because she was saved. She was a saved person. She got, she, I could take you to the church where she got saved at, a Baptist church. She was baptized. She knew. And she had enough discernment to be able to pick out when they were trying to teach her something that wasn't true. They tried to teach she could lose your salvation. She raised her hand. She said, you can't lose your salvation. Let me give you the Bible verses. And she told them. But she said, she said, Dad, I could take you to the very spot in jail where I finally said, I'm not fighting you anymore, Lord. I'm not going to fight you anymore. And I just surrendered. And I want to fight him ever again. She said, Dad, all of the problem has been me. It's been me fighting God rather than just let him have his way, rather than just trust. She said, I don't know why Paul ever stayed with me as long as he did, but I'm going to pray and believe that God's going to put us back together. But she said, I just had to come to the place where I quit fighting God. Let me ask you something tonight. Are you fighting him? Unbelief. It's unbelief. You know, you're fighting when he tells you how to dress. Well, I'm not giving, I'm not giving into that. Well, unbelief. Well, I don't care what, what you know, preach, show me 15 different passages in the Bible. I, I can't afford to tithe. No, it's unbelief. I'll never be a soul winner. That's just not me. No, that's unbelief. You see, you have to come and say, God knows what's best for me. It doesn't matter if I'm comfortable. That's not the issue. It matters if I'm obedient. And if I'm obedient, he'll give me the comfort. We've got to trust him. Many years ago, I saw in a, a Moody revival, D.L. Moody, in 1886, he was preaching a revival meeting. They asked for testimonies. There was a young teenage boy stood up, and he said, I don't know a whole lot about the Christian life. All I know is I need to trust and obey. The song leader wrote it down on a little piece of paper, stuck it in his Bible. He got home, and he, and he made an arrangement, and he called a preacher friend of his and said, we need to put words to this. And so they did. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we'll trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, or for them who will trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Got to lay aside the weight and the sin, which so easily besets us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. Thank you that you're such a wonderful God that can be trusted. Thank you that everything you have planned and prepared into the course designed individually for each of us to run, Lord, that we can trust that it will be the best, refreshing, joy-filled life if we'll just trust and obey. Help us tonight. I don't know what anybody's struggling with. I don't know who, who's overcome with worry and stress and depression and anger and discouragement and bitterness and unforgiveness. And, but, Lord, would you help us tonight? 
to lay it all on the altar and just to trust and obey. The heartaches that come, Lord, help us to trust and obey. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody looking. Maybe there's somebody tonight, and the truth is, you know there's some weights. Things that in and of themselves are not sinful. But they've hindered your, your service for the Lord, your faithfulness to the Lord, faithfulness to church. My son, who pastors in Iowa, had a, a new convert, been saved about six months, got kind of long, shaggy hair, came in his office before church. He said, Pastor, my son looked up and said, Good night, I didn't recognize you. Your hair's cut. He said, Yeah. He said, Well, I never said anything to you about it. He said, No, I just don't want to hinder my service for the Lord. What an attitude. You got a weight that's holding you back. Why don't you lay it at the altar tonight? Does the Lord speak to your heart? I wonder who tonight would say, Brother Booth, be honest with you. If I died right now, I'm not sure I'm even saved. I've got doubts about that. I don't want to die and go to hell. And I can't tell you that I'm 100% sure that I'm going to heaven. And I'm burdened about that. And if I could know for sure that I was saved, forgiven, and on my way to heaven, I'd like to know that. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that tonight? See little hands? Anybody else? I'd sure appreciate you wouldn't talk during the invitation time. I wonder tonight who might say, Brother Booth, I'm saved on my way to heaven, but I needed that tonight. Yeah, maybe you're digging out your own cistern. Oh, I won't, I won't ever end up like those people you talk. Oh, really? That's exactly what they said. Exactly. The deceitfulness of sin, hardened heart. When's the last time you've been to an altar? You mean to tell me you can sit under the preaching of a man of God like it's in this church and never feel like you need to go to an altar? I'm going to tell you something's wrong with your heart. I can't sin under that kind of preaching without needing to go to the altar. God's speaking to me constantly. I wonder tonight who'd say, Brother Booth, I needed the message. I'm saved on my way to heaven, but God spoke to my heart tonight. God knew what I needed. Pray for me as a Christian. Would you slip your hands up tonight, Christians? God spoke to your heart. God bless you. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Number of hands. Many hands. God bless you. Thank you. You may put them down. There's something you know right now you're fighting. You're just fighting. I just don't want to give in on that. Be the greatest relief when you do. You just say, Lord, I can trust you. Here it is. Let's stand for prayer. After I pray, by the Bible scene, God spoke in your heart. You need to come tonight. You come, would you? Heavenly Father, bless now this invitation. Seal decisions, Lord. You know what's going on in hearts I don't know. And I pray you'd give victories tonight. Help us to be humble enough to respond and to trust you, Lord. And to just cast our care upon you and just leave it with you. And, and be able to have that, that peace and joy of knowing that a sovereign, wonderful, powerful God has our best interest at heart. Bless the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Some music plays. Brother Bob sings, you need to come. You come, would you? When we walk with the Lord in God the light your heart. Come on. of His Word, what Be honest with Him tonight. He sheds on our way. Are you a controller? While we do, you got to be in charge. You got to be. You got to make sure everything happens your way. Still, Can't go far in the Christian life without surrendering that control to Him. Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You hear the words? It's amazing Not when you stand up here and preach. Sometimes you can look at faces, and there is no happiness in the there. The countenance isn't there. But it's my that joy in knowing that you're right with the Lord. Sometimes you can just see it. Not a doubt or no a devil's fear. got you convinced. Don't Not give in. Don't give in. Don't give in. And you're missing it. And abide you're missing while it. We trust and obey. Not got something you need to surrender tonight? We bear. Not a sorrow we share. An area, area you need to just say, okay, God, I'm not carrying that baggage any longer. Not I'm not dragging that around with me anymore, Lord. 
I don't understand it, but I don't have to, Lord. I'm just going to trust you. Blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and yeah, Brother obey. Booth, but I've been hurt. Trust me. No I know a little bit about hurt. Way I know a little bit about shedding tears. In Jesus, but but also know that I've got a Savior obey. that hasn't made one mistake in my whole but life. We never and he's not going to make prove. one. The so we run that race just looking unto him. Until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Sing the chorus with him. Trust, trust and, and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the powerful message from your word tonight. Lord, that was the truth that we all needed to hear this evening. Thank you, Lord, for ministering to our hearts tonight and giving us what we needed to hear. Now, Father, I pray that we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. And Lord, I pray that those who are still battling you, still holding out, that, Lord, they'd have a restless night tonight. And, Lord, that they would know the sweetness and the joy of falling on their knees before you and yielding and submitting themselves to you. And they'll know that they're to be happy in Jesus. We trust and obey. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's been here this evening. Thank you for what we've heard tonight from your word. Dismiss us with your care, Lord, and I pray that you'll keep our thoughts and our minds focused on this meeting and what you have in store for us yet tomorrow night if you tarry your coming. And Lord, watch over us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's sing that as our closing. Go to 337. I think that's what it is, isn't it? Is that trust and obey? 337. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word. Let's do the first stanza and the chorus, all right? Let's hear you sing it. Ready? When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. God bless you. You're dismissed.